have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is where we will uh, be reading from today. And I find it appropriate, our prayer requests that we've had, and, and um, at least our discussion in, in Sunday school this morning and some other things that have taken place recently, that the scripture that we're going to talk about today is really our call as disciples, what Jesus is calling us to when it comes to discipleship. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at all the other disciples, again, this series, They Ate Too. We've looked at all of them, and, and we've talked about how different they are, and, uh, and yet Jesus still calls all of them to his table, and, and how different each of us are, our, our, our upbringings, our economic backgrounds, the list goes on and on, our different jobs, uh, and yet Jesus still loves us enough to call each and every single one of us to his table. Uh, so that we can sup together, more importantly, we can eat with Him, amen, and be in His presence. And I think that's very important because in, in Matthew chapter 10, uh, there's a lot that Jesus talks about, and uh, maybe that's the reason why not a lot of people showed up today, because Wednesday night I said we're going to talk about the whole chapter, and everybody's like, well, I can just stay home and read that. Maybe, maybe that was a thought, but that's okay. We're here, and God's going to show up, amen? God has showed up, and so we thank you for that, and uh, expecting him to continue to do so. But in Matthew chapter 10, there's some interesting things that takes place. And so uh, it helps us to really see where we fit and where we, we belong, maybe as disciples of Christ. Uh, we know that as Jesus, right before he ascends into heaven, he gives that final command, go and make Christ like disciples in the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there's also specific instructions that he gives throughout his ministry as to what discipleship looks like and what we are called to do and maybe even some of the things that, some of the difficulties that we'll face during our, our relationship, our journey with him. And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. So if you would stand with me one more time, please. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 10 and our specific verse today is uh, verse 39. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. The scripture's on the screen. But this is the word of the Lord for us today. Matthew chapter 10 verse 39 says this, If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Father, thank you for the reading of your word today. And thank you for what you've already done in our service today. I pray, God, that you would continue to show up. And Lord, you would continue to help us get out of the way and let you be glorified and let you receive all the honor today, Father. I pray, God, that as we talk about this passage in Matthew chapter 10, that you would open our hearts and open our minds, Father. God, that you would help us to hear from you, and that it be your words that come forth and not simply my own. God, we love you this morning. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. So, uh, who can guess what today is? Yeah, but it's also WrestleMania weekend. Woo! Or it's just Palm Sunday, too. Yeah, I mean, that's a good WrestleMania weekend. Woo! Yeah. Thank you, Brother Philip. Just get past that, right? WrestleMania means nothing. It's an awesome night last night. Another good night tonight. Y'all don't care about WrestleMania. It's the greatest show in the world, according to WWE, right? Man. Next Sunday, I'm going to preach on WrestleMania. I'm just playing. I'm not doing that at all. So anyways, uh, it is Palm Sunday, and, and we're not going to take the typical Palm Sunday approach. You know the story. Uh, Jesus comes in, held as king, rides in on a donkey. People take their coats off and put palm leaves down. It says, Hosanna, right? Glory to the Son of David. Glory to the Son of God. He's finally, he's finally here, held as king. And at the beginning of that week, the very same ones that are saying, Hosanna, glory to God, are the same ones that are saying, put him on a cross, crucify him, let him die. Before all that takes place, though, before all of this takes place, because really, if you go through and you look at Scripture, it's as if it's boom, 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 one thing after the other. There's no way that we could fit all three years' worth of Jesus' ministry in any one particular book. The book would just be so huge. Uh, John, John even says that. But if we go back and we look at the Gospels, uh, the Gospel writers were so... Uh, specific in some of the things that they shared with us so that they can truly reveal who Jesus was, who Jesus is, uh, and the purpose of Jesus. But not only that, what our purpose is as Christ followers, right? 
And so the disciples uh, wrote, or at least the apostle writers, or the gospel writers, I should say, wrote the gospels after Jesus had already ascended, and they had lived into or embraced the ministry that Jesus had called them to, right? So they had already had some experience. This power that these gospel writers talk about, the significance of, of the teaching of, of the kingdom of heaven, that it has come near, the significance of that teaching, the love and the passion of Jesus Christ, they've experienced it firsthand, amen? And so they're documenting what takes place. But in, in, in Matthew chapter 10, before Palm Sunday, before Easter Sunday, before any of these things happen, Jesus makes it a point to pull all the disciples aside and he gives them specific instructions on what their call is as the apostles, what their call is as the disciples. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Because wrapped in their specific call, we begin to unpack and to see what our specific call is as a disciple of Christ. Yes, we all have specific callings. I'm called to be a pastor. He's called to be an evangelist. Tommy, unwillingly, was called to be a, a song leader, right? I won't go into that story. You don't have time for that. But anyways, uh, we all have these unique callings. But most of all, we're all called to love the Lord our God with our heart and soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbor as ourself, and we're all called to be his disciples, right? When we say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, you were saying, Lord, I am accepting being your disciple, right? That's what we're accepting. And with that comes certain expectations and certain things that Christ has called us to. Things that we're called to embrace. And so when Jesus is, is telling these disciples, at least towards the end of, of, of Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Now, each one of the disciples in some way, shape, or form embraced this verse from Christ, embraced these words one embraced it selfishly, right? One embraced it selfishly, and in doing so, he lost his life, right? Judas Iscariot, we talked about that last week. The other disciples embraced what Jesus was actually trying to say, right? They chose to give up their life. They chose to give up the money that came with some of their jobs. They chose to give up with the status that came with who they once were. They chose to give up uh, even some of their rights in some areas of, of this country in order to follow Jesus Christ, in order to be Jesus' disciple. And so Jesus begins, he tells, uh, he tells them that their first call uh, to the disciples, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to leave them open. If you have your phone, open the Bible app, whatever you need to do, Google Matthew 10, because we're kind of going to walk through this, this chapter together uh, today. But Jesus starts by, by telling them that when you go, he, so he, he names each one of the 12 disciples, and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and you're called to cast out demons, you're called to heal lepers, you're called to raise the dead, right? He gives them this charge, and he gives them the authority to do so. But he says, before you go out into the world, and just doing that whenever you think you can or wherever you think you need to be, you first need to go to your own people. You first need to go to your own people. As a matter of fact, Jesus says uh, that the mission of the disciples will first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The New Living Translation refers it to uh, the God's lost people in verse 6. The key word there, loss, uh, it's, it means being, uh, it is a result of neglect by the shepherd, right? So being lost is a result of being neglected by the shepherd. So it's not that God turned his back on Israel is that it's that Israel's prophets, at least in this day, has chosen to what? Be quiet. They've chosen not to talk because between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the time of silence. There wasn't really much talk uh, about God and, and about his laws and about his rules. And so, quite frankly, their leaders, their spiritual leaders, failed them. They didn't talk about Jesus, didn't talk about the Messiah, didn't talk about God, didn't talk about the Son of Man, didn't talk about their responsibilities as being Christ followers and good little Jewish people, right? We get that, right? So there was a failure on the church's part of their responsibility, okay? And so Jesus says, the people that you are going to first are the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, again, these boundary lines of the 12 tribes weren't as clear as they once were, weren't as defined as they once were. There was a lot that took place between that and where they are, at least historically, where they are now. But guess what? There's still a remnant, right? There's still some people there that are, that are still God's chosen people. There's still some people there that, that need to know the truth about the Messiah. And so they're called first to go to minister to uh, these people first. That's why Jesus says, I've come for both the Jew and the Gentile, right? 
I've come for my people, but I've also come for the world. Right, so he says, don't go to just anybody. Don't go to the Gentiles first. I want you to go to the uh, Jewish people and talk to them first. And your message is simple. To proclaim or to announce that the message, uh, that the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus gave them this authority to, again, do all these great miraculous things. But most importantly, the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's close. And so we need to prepare ourselves. You need to prepare yourselves. It's interesting because as we walk through this, this, this chapter, we see that Jesus then tells them not to take anything with them. Don't take any money. Don't take any luggage. Don't even take a walking stick. This particular sending, if you will, was to be short-term. It was a short-term mission trip, if you will, if you want to think about it, at least in the context of what's going on right here. Don't take anything with you. And when you go to these towns, find a reputable person, find someone worthy enough, and stay in their home, right? Now, get this. There's a group of 12 men that are going from town to town preaching the gospel. Houses really weren't that big back then, right? And so if they found somebody worthy, and they said, come on, you could stay with me, man, that was some tight quarters, right? Tight quarters. Uh, did they even have enough blankets for all of them? Probably not. Did they all have cots or beds? Probably not, right? So they did these things knowing that it would be a, a rough journey to say the, to say the, to the least, right? Not much sleep that, that happens uh, where they're fixing to go. And so when you go from town to town, uh, find this trustworthy person and stay with them and, and, and accept their hospitality and their blessings, right? Expect their, don't be hesitant in accepting their hospitality. If there's one thing that we do, especially in our culture today, it's hard to sometimes accept blessings from people and hospitality from people. Why? Because I got everything figured out on my own and I can do it myself, right? Amen? You need some help with something? I got it. You're going to re-roof your house by yourself. Yep, I'm going to do it by myself. I don't need your help. Do you know anything about roofing? Nope, but I'll figure it out as I go. Well, good luck, right? That's, that's most men's mentality. I'm going to change the oil on my own. Yep, okay. Have you ever done it before? Nope, but I'm going to figure it out on my own. Well, can I give you a pointer? Nope, okay. Well, just watch out. When you turn that little knob at the bottom, the oil's going to get all over you. Just warning you. Just be careful about that. And don't do it as soon as you turn the vehicle off because it's going to be real hot, right? It's going to be real hot. Learn that the hard way. Because I said, no, I got this, right? I said, I got it on my own. Jesus says, accept the hospitality and accept the blessings. Again, I go back to that time in Marksville. There was a guy there. I did. I had a scuffed up shoe, and I didn't care. Nice church shoe. Guy there said, Charlie, let me take you out, and I'm going to buy you a new pair of shoes. I was prideful back then. No, I got it. It's okay. Thank you very much. I told my dad that. My dad said, how dare you take that blessing from someone? So now when somebody does that to me, I yeah, that's the Lord talking to you to me something ain't right and you need to help me fix it amen or maybe the Lord is speaking to you no matter how good these shoes look or don't not saying anything just saying right I don't wear suits so don't say the Lord said I'm going to go and buy you a suit don't don't I might have to reject that blessing just just being honest just being honest with you actually I'll tell you to take that money and give it to somebody else that really needs it amen that's what I'll tell you to do amen we're on the same page here, right? All right, so he says, uh, go and, and, and I'm spending too much time on that because chapter 10 is long. I've already been 13 minutes. That's okay. The Lord loves us. Amen? Amen. Accept this hospitality and the blessings. And if the town's not good to you, if the people's not good to you, what does he say? Kick off the dust and go on to the next town. Kick the dust off your shoe and go on to the next town. We get all the way down to verse 16, and then Jesus kind of, transitions from directly speaking to the disciples mission as far as the immediate uh, people that they're to go and minister to which are the Jewish people he still continues to, to tell them to do that but then he kind of broadens this instruction to to more than just the 12 disciples uh, and he says this in verse 16 and it seems kind of harsh when Jesus says this he says look I am sending you out a sheep among wolves I'm sending you out among, as sheep among wolves. Jesus is telling that the disciples, that a lot of the people that they encounter will have been misled and taken advantage of spiritually. What did I tell you about the remnant that was left behind and what happened, how quiet it was between the end of uh, the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, right? 
Not many people said anything, and if they did, they were probably misled, and they were spiritually abused. We could argue that. Spiritually abused. How do we know that? You go back and you read how so people were so focused on doing the law and making sure the law was done when, when, when man had taken the law from ten things or a hundred things and just blew it up into so many you couldn't even wake up in the morning hardly, right? And so Jesus says that a lot of those people have been misled and spiritually abused. And so he says, yes, it will be like you are sheep among the wolves. The disciples' teaching of love and compassion and how Jesus would bring about true salvation would be difficult for other people to hear, especially the Jewish people. It would be hard for them to hear. It would be challenging for them to hear. And it would even be anger-inducing. Why do I know that? Because during Holy Week, the same people that said, Hosanna, glory to the Son of David, are the very same ones that said, put him on a cross. Anger-inducing. This message of love and peace. Are you telling me that's just how easy it is to accept God as the Messiah, to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah, that he is Lord? That's it. That's how easy it is. Well, what about this law? And what about this? I've been doing this my whole life. Does that matter? It does. Thank you for your faithfulness. But Jesus says all you have to do is confess my name, right? And that's it. That could be kind of angry. You're telling me that I've worked, as Jesus said in this parable, I've worked for 10 hours a day and this person's only worked for one and they get the same pay? Yeah, because I hired you for the same amount, right? Jesus says the person that saved me or served me their whole life and the person that comes to know me in the last hour of their life, guess what? They both still receive salvation. They both still receive eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. Amen? Jesus is telling them that the message that you're going to teach is going to be hard for some of these people to hear, anger-inducing, and that the leaders, the religious leaders in the towns and the villages that you go to, they're going to want to hurt you. Zephaniah even warned of this. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 says this, uh, What sorrow, now listen to this as I read this because a city is going to come to your mind. I'm not going to say a specific city because I'm going to let you think about that, all right? But there's some specific cities that have come to mind when I read Zephaniah. What sorrow awaits rebellious, polluted Jerusalem, the city of violence and crime. No one can tell, it, uh, can tell it anything. It refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. It's like a ravenous wolf at night who, uh, I'm sorry, it's, its leaders are like roaring lions hunting uh, for their victims. It's like a judge who's a ravenous wolf at evening, who by dawn has left no trace of their prey. Its prophets are arrogant liars seeking their own gain. Its priests defile the temple by disobeying God's instruction. There's a lot of cities that we know of that fit that bill. A lot of leaders that we know of that probably fit that bill. This was the city, one of the cities, that the disciples were called to go into and teach and preach and share the gospel. The very city that Jesus goes into and preaches and teaches that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Because all the disciples would be challenging the authority and the teachings of the leaders of the city, this truly meant that their lives might be in danger. That's why he says, you're going to be like sheep among the wolves. Uh, Proverbs 28, 15, a wicked ruler is as dangerous to the poor as a roaring lion or an attacking bear. Now, what did the disciples take with them? They would be considered what? Poor and powerless. They would be considered weak, little men, in a city full of Roman soldiers, in a city full of people armed with the law, corrupted though it may be, right? These are the, this is the city they were going into. Because these disciples would be sent out with nothing, they would be considered poor and powerless But what did Jesus say I'm sending you with? My authority. And it's to cast out demons. And it's to heal the lepers. And it's to raise the dead. And it's to preach the gospel. Talking about power. Don't need any money. Don't need any stick. Jesus sends them with all the authority and the power they need. Jesus then describes or tells them about these rulers. And he says, when they come to challenge you, don't be afraid of them. In fact, in verse 18, he says, it will be your opportunity to tell these rulers and other unbelievers about me. It'll be an opportunity for you to preach the gospel. It'll be an opportunity for you to share your testimony about what I've done in your life, what you've seen me do, the miracles you've watched me work, the teachings that I've taught you. Amen? 
When those people come against you, when those people in life come against you, that's not our time to run. That's our time to stand firm on our beliefs, that of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's our time to be bold and share our testimony. Well, I don't really talk to a lot of people. Okay, well, maybe you need to start. Amen? I don't like talking in front of people. That's fine. One person's not a lot of people. Amen? Right? See how much we blow that out of proportion? Well, I can't talk to that person. It's one person. The worst they could do is ignore you and go about the day. You've done your part. Amen? You've done your part. Jesus tells him when this moment comes, it's going to be your opportunity. So he's saying that even among the wolves, you have an opportunity to share the gospel. Even among unbelievers, some will listen. And in fact, those that do decide to listen, those that do decide to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as it says in verse 22, but everyone who endures to the end, what? Will be saved. Amen? Those that listen to what you're going to teach, those of you that fully embrace my teaching, because we got to remember, Judas was part of the 12 that Jesus was talking to. Judas was one of the ones that was sent out, right? Thomas the doubter was one of the ones that was sent out. Peter the rejecter, if you will, three different times was one of the ones that was sent out, right? So these very ones, Jesus is saying that everyone, everyone, if you accept my teaching, if you believe that I am the Son of Man, will be saved. If you endure these hardships, if you endure the name calling, if you endure some of the abuse that you may receive for my name's sake, guess what? It'll be worth it all because you'll be saved. You receive salvation in its fullest. He then goes down to uh, verses 24 through 23, and he begins to talk about the assurance, his assurance that he gives to the disciples, the, dis the assurance that we have on our are in our discipleship journey. He tells them in 26, uh, don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everyone or when everything that is covered will be revealed and all, the, uh, all that is secret will be made known to all. All the spiritual abuse that these people are, are, are telling you, all the things, all the ways that they've misled you, you will see one day that their teachings are wrong. You will see that one day the way that they tried to teach you to live according to God, quote unquote, was wrong. Jesus comes in and says, I've come to fulfill the law. And he says, as a matter of fact, the new law that I give, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Go and make Christ-like disciples. Serve. That's all Jesus tells us to do. That's all that we're called to do as disciples. And so Jesus is saying that there's only one reason for us to be, have this reverent, awe-inspiredness, and that's only before God. He says, if you fear God, right? He says, we must fear God and the authority, because he has the authority to what? Destroy the body and soul, not just the body. And so he's talking about this assurance that we have with him. And, and when we stand before God or when we speak the name of God, as we said in the song a while ago, we stand in awe of who he is. And we, there's this reverent appreciation about speaking the name of God and, and being in the presence of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, Right? And because we know the Spirit goes with us everywhere we go, that being in awe of who He is should be with us all the time. Amen? When something surprising happens, we should be, oh, thank you, Lord, for that surprise. Thank you, God, for that moment, for that opportunity. This is what Christ is calling them to. Don't be afraid. You have an opportunity. So he's, he's telling them that, uh, that God is the only one that has authority over the body and soul. To be, to be uh, stand in awe, inspire this reverent appreciation of who he is, to, to fear God. Why? Because he's God and he cares for us and he desires all of us to draw closer to him and to understand him better. Jesus illustrates this by talking about sparrows. Sparrows. We, we know a little bit about sparrows. What are you talking about, Charlie? Those birds that fly in masses over our house, and we think, oh, please don't let nothing happen. I just got my car washed. Right? Sparrows. They consume mine and Donna's and Nick's and our neighbor and Mr. Haggard's yards sometimes. Right? Monte Carlo's not a big space, and so that whole street is full of these sparrows. Somebody slams a car door. Somebody slams their, their house door, and pfft, you just see this black cloud come up, right? So we have an idea of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus says, let me find it because this is good. 
Jesus says, so don't be afraid. Oh, so the sparrow is only worth one piece of copper. Each sparrow is worth one piece of copper. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable than a whole flock of sparrows. Amen? Now, you're obviously worth a whole lot more than a hundred or a thousand or a hundred thousand, a million dollars, copper coins. Your life is so valuable that he decided to give up his own son's life for you. Greatest sacrifice that could ever be made, Right? You're much more valuable than these stinking sparrows. So in the midst of all this, Jesus then reminds them in verses 32 and 33, everyone who acknowledges me publicly on the earth, what? I will also acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But he also says, if you deny me before anyone in our, on, on earth, I have no choice but deny you in front of my Father in heaven. There's some tough words. So I'm giving you all authority and I'm telling you where to go and I'm telling you what to do. He gives us some authority and he tells us what to do and who to speak to and who to minister to and, and the people that we're called to love, right? But if we fail to acknowledge Jesus Christ publicly, that's the key word there, among those around us, he'll fail to acknowledge us before his Father in heaven. Those are some strong words. We don't fully understand how strong these words are again until a couple of chapters later when we see Jesus being beaten and bruised and hung on a cross to die for our sins. That also puts perspective into what happened to the disciples when they ran, when that mob came. Instead of them standing firm and saying, this is our Lord, this is our Messiah, what did they do? Took off. Had no care at that point what was happening to Jesus, they were worried about themselves at that moment, right? Fortunately, they had the opportunity, most of them did, to go back and get things right with Jesus. But Jesus says, if you acknowledge me before men, if you acknowledge me publicly here on this earth, I will do so in heaven. Again, these are the words that the disciples were reminded of in a very real way. And so foreshadowing what will happen, not only in the original 12's lives, but also in ours, Jesus then begins to talk about this cost of discipleship. Verses 34 through 39. You know, these men got really close to each other. Some would argue they became like family. More than best friends, they became brothers, right? Jesus should still remain their top priority. We as a church, sometimes we get real close, amen? Some of you have been best friends your entire life. Some of you have become really good friends of mine over the last couple of years. But man, Christ is still our number one priority. I love Sierra with my whole being. But man, Jesus Christ is still ahead of our marriage, still ahead of our life, right? I mean, he's the one that allows us to be married and have these kids. Sometimes I'm like, no, I'm just playing. I love my husband. I love him to death. I'm just playing. And so here Jesus is saying, and, and we can skew this sometimes, uh, Jesus says, I've not come to, to bring peace, but I've come to bring a sword. And Jesus is not necessarily calling us to hate our family or our friends or to physically harm them in any way, but Jesus is saying that if we choose to hold those people in higher regards to him, then we've got some issues. Our relationships, our priorities are thrown off a little bit. And so Jesus is saying that you're going to have some uncomfortable situations with those people in your life. Hard conversations with some people in your life. Man, I can't tell you how, whatever I, I have this premarital counseling with, with those that I marry, one of the first things I tell them, I says, when, you, when you're married, you realize that's your number one. Obviously, there's Jesus, but that's your spouse. Your mom or dad's no longer in the picture, right? I mean, they are, but you don't answer to them. You kind of do. You respect them. But they don't necessarily have that authority that they've always had, right? You now have, have, this, you now have the authority to go in any amount of debt you want to go into. Amen? And your daddy's not holding your credit card like, ah, right? You get what I'm saying? And then when you have that argument, it's with each other, not necessarily, well, dad, why did you take my card away? Right? It now becomes between. And so there's this importance of just as Jesus says, if we cling to our life, we lose it. If we don't 
leave our family and cling to each other, that, that, that's, that relationship is out of whack, right? It's, it's, it's off kilter, if you will. Our relationship with Christ, if we hold our family, if we hold our friends in higher regards to Christ, to, to, than Jesus, then it's off, it's off a little bit. Things just don't always go the way that we had hoped. So Jesus has come, yes, I've come to, 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 to cause difficult situations, to have hard conversations, to have uncomfortable situations with those that you love because I am coming to literally give up my life so that you can have a life. Amen? And not just have a life on this earth, but have a life for eternity, an abundant life. That's far greater than anything else that earth could ever, ever give. And again, he says in verse 39, if you cling to your life, you'll, you, you will lose it. But if you give your life up for me, you will find it. This is the life of a disciple. This is the cost of, it, of discipleship, right? The cost of discipleship is having awkward conversations with people. We get that, right? The cost of, of, of being a disciple is being in uncomfortable situations. I remember one time... A, one of the previous churches I was serving at, the pastor calls me up and he says, Charlie, I'm out of town. We have a lady in our church that uh, her, they're, they're going through a divorce, but she was going to her house to get the stuff and the husband was drunk. Charlie, I need you to go and help move this lady. What? Thanks, pastor. Put me in that situation. Way to go, preacher, right? I was worried. I was scared. I'm not going to lie. It was 8, 9 o'clock at night already. I'd already had my pajamas on. Amen. Get up, get redressed, go over to the lady's house, get the few things that she needed to get, went to the storage unit, every, unloaded everything, and everything was fine. Husband didn't do anything. But, man, I was praying the whole way there. Lord, help me. Lord, be with this situation. And he did. He was. God didn't say anything to me. Thank God. Because I would not have known how to respond. Amen? God helps us in those situations. The cost of discipleship is being part of those awkward situations, having those awkward conversations with people. These disciples going to the Jewish people, that was a hard conversation. Those were awkward situations for them. But God gave them all authority. Amen? God gave them all authority. God was with them every step of the way as they ministered. In accepting Jesus, we are giving up our wants and our desires, our comforts, our will in pursuit of His. This past week at Bible study, that was one of our discussions was Given our, giving up our desires for his desire, right? That God gives us the desires of our heart. What some people fail to understand is God gives us the desires of our heart because when we're in relationship with him, our desires become his desires, amen? And so that's how that works. That we, we get the desires of our heart, yes, because I, I, you tell me somebody, tell me I'm wrong, but those of you that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your family, you love them more now, Amen? Your friends, you love them more now because you know that they don't have the Lord like you do and that their life is going down a much different path than yours is going. And so you're trying to do everything you can to get them to see Jesus. You're nicer to them when you don't want to be nicer to them, amen? You actually talk to them, amen? Come on now, right? You love them. You have the desire of Jesus in your life that they would truly become something brand new, that they would understand who Jesus is in the deepest of ways. Amen? This is what Jesus is saying when the disciples are going, so you're giving up your life, yes, so that I can receive more of Jesus and in turn receive this life that he has desired for me to have since the beginning of creation. Amen? This true union and communion with God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Again, in doing this, we realize that his ways are much greater than our ways, and his thinking is much greater than our thinking. But sometimes we choose to cling on to our lives, like Judas did. Our lives are temporary, stress-filled, anger-ridden, anxiety-induced, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Now, do those things magically go away whenever we have a relationship with Christ? No. We just have another way to deal with them. Amen? And fortunately, Jesus says, cast all your cares on me. Why? Because I care for you. Amen? Because I love you. And so, yes, we still go through those difficult and awkward situations, as the disciples have and will, but they've got Jesus Christ with them every step of the way. 
They have all the authority of Christ with them every step of the way. Amen? So the cost of discipleship, is it great? It is a great cost. But man, it's well worth it. It's well worth it. It's so wild the decision to follow Jesus may be a tough one. It may even cost our relationship with our friends and our families. The sacrifice is well worth it. Because then we begin to have the desires of Jesus. Then we begin to see people the way that Jesus may see them. And we begin to hear people the way Jesus hears them, right? Man, we have a heart that, that Christ has for those around us. This is what Jesus is calling each one of these disciples to. Yes, go to your people. So how do we reference that? Go to your family. Go to your friends. Go to your inner circle, if you haven't already, and be Jesus to them. Amen? Go to your coworkers and be Jesus to them. Go to my students on the bus and be Jesus to them. Amen? Show them the love of Jesus. We'll bash them over the Bible. If you don't accept this, then what does that do? Nothing. Pushes them further and further away. Well, you're, you got to, oh, well, good, okay? Tell me about this. What does that mean? If, you're, if we're so intent on, you got to know the Bible, you got to know the Bible, tell me a scripture, amen? Just being honest. We know John 3.16, what does 3.17 say? I didn't come to judge, but to love, amen? That's what Christ said. And I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword, Difficult moments that we're called to have in order to hopefully bring somebody to Jesus. This is what the disciples were facing. As they went to their own people, as they went to the Jewish people, they loved them with the, the love of, of Jesus. Again, all 12 of them were sent. We get that, right? Judas was in the middle of this. Jesus even called him to do great things. But when it got to that point where he says, if you cling to your own life, you will lose it. That's basically what happened to Judas. He decided to... Be selfish in a way. Decided to grab it all in. Wanted it all for himself. And thus we see what happens. Now again, our lives are good. Each of us, I would say our lives are great. Uh, especially the country that we live in. We have more opportunities than most of the world combined. The, our minimum wage is far above and beyond what people would earn in Africa and other places around the world. Obviously, Portions of Africa, I should say, to qualify that. But that doesn't give us the right to just sit back and do nothing. <laughs> Amen? That doesn't give us the, the right to just come in on Sunday morning and sit in the pew and listen to a guy talk for 45 minutes. Right? It's actually 37 minutes. And sit there and do nothing about it. That doesn't give us the right to wake up in the morning and read our devotion and say, Thank you, Lord, that was good, and put the Bible down and not actually do what it says. Amen? I mean, let's just be honest for a, a moment. I'm, I'm glad you wake up and I'm glad you read your Bible. I am. We need to do more of that. But pff, we just push it down and say that's it. We've missed it. You're simply reading the Bible. <laughs> right? There's a difference in that. This cost of discipleship. Again, these, these 12 men went on to do some great these 11 men went on to do some great things for the church. The Holy Spirit filled them in such a way that the world has literally never been the same. All because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, all because the gift of the Holy Spirit, all because this plan that God had put in motion since before creation, right? We are getting to play a part of that. You get that, right? We are getting to play a part of that. And so these very same things that Jesus has called these disciples to, to love, to, to, to go forth and have awkward situations, to be uncomfortable because of Jesus Christ, in those situations, we need to remind ourselves, what, all authority has been given to me, Jesus says, and he says, now go, make Christ-like disciples. I, I, he breathed on them, peace be with you, peace I leave with you. Those moments, those difficult moments, those awkward moments, Jesus is with us through the power of the Holy Spirit every step of the way. Amen? This week, I challenge you to have one of those uncomfortable conversations. I challenge you to have one of those awkward moments, if you will. Um, especially during the week of, of, of a holy week of Easter. Again, all throughout this week, I encourage you to read Matthew chapter 21 on. 
You really see what Jesus went through, the teachings. It's interesting. If you're not sure what takes place, Jesus comes in uh, being held as king, right? What's the very first thing he does? He goes to the temple and he makes a statement. This is why I've come. Amen? I would ask you the question, the people that you go and you talk with, what, what is taking place in that relationship to where Jesus Christ maybe isn't working? Have you not been bold enough? Is the situation maybe too awkward for you and you've kind of pushed away? There's people in my life, I'll just be honest with you, that's where I'm at. It's just awkward. And sometimes we just got to break that awkwardness. We got to break that silence. Sometimes you don't talk to people because you know it's going to be awkward, right? You just got to break that silence and have that conversation with them. Where's your heart? How's your relationship with the Lord? Just talk with them. Because you care for them, amen? And you desire for them to, to be with Christ. If you would stand with me, please, as we close in prayer.